I hope the film broaden helps us expand our imagination of what other can be. I think it starts from a kind of humanoid other. That's our tendency, um, but hopefully gets bigger than that. And we can start thinking about perhaps a more mineral other or a non-biotic other or an other that, that looks and propagates and moves so different than a human form that um, it can be difficult to relate to, but maybe necessary <laughs> that we start um, expanding our sense of what the other can be. Yes, this picture, I, I was uh, <laughs> impressed by it. Well, it's raindrop autographs older than the pharaohs. Is this the, the kind of mineral other you, you, you were talking about? And do you see a, a continuity between the, these raindrops and human drawings? Yes, in a way. I mean, I, I was fascinated with this image and including it because throughout the film, I keep, it, it keeps reminding us that um, rocks, stones have a text if you know how to read them. If you're a geologist and you look at a certain mountain range, you read the history there, you read a series of events. Like there used to be a an ocean here. These are the roots of ancient mountain belts. This is a stratigraphy of, you know, centuries and centuries of diatoms and other um, plankton that swam around and died and drifted to the bottom of the ocean and then created sedimentary rock. So I guess in a way it's a nod, <clears throat> this image is a nod to the fact that there is writing and reading to be done that is happening all around us all the time that is not anthropic. It's a kind of writing that happens through the stone. And so this is a shortcut way, I guess, of saying that. And I also liked following it up because the image that appears right before this, this image of kind of um, fossilized um, raindrops is an image of um, that's quite typical um, in ancient peoples on the earth where they'll leave a mark of their hand. Um, and sometimes it's outlined by like spraying ochre from the mouth or sometimes it's etched and it's um, <clears throat> a petroglyph and not a graph. But anyway, it's a, it's a standard um, mark that's made and before I was working on this film, I always thought of those as a sort of tag, like a human tag, I was here, you know, uh, leaving your initials. But after and during working on the film, I started thinking of it as a sign that someone was there and someone was listening. Like to put one's hand on something that could potentially vibrate, which everything can vibrate, is a sign of, um, it's a way of listening and or paying attention to something that's not you. <laughs> There's a knowledge that comes through touch that is just as valuable and just as um has just as much authority as knowledge that comes through data or knowledge that comes through an image that I think um, knowledge that comes through felt or touched um, phenomena has often been devalued. And part of my interest in the film is revaluing these other ways of knowing. Would you say your film is more um, more tactile than optic? Um, maybe not more, but I think because, I mean, sound is touch at a distance. That's what it is. 
And because the sound is something that is um, a huge part of how I craft <laughs> what I'm doing, I do think that the film engages in the haptic in a way that a lot of films might not do quite as much. The film is a, is a very heavily sampled film. There's a lot of quotations from often scientific sources and archives um, found in labs and in museums and online. Um, and partly that was a product of just working during COVID and needing to stick with a research, you know, that was very studio based, but also um, I'm a big believer in if the image exists, <laughs> just, you, you know, if it's already out there, let's use it and let's sample it. So I, if I, you know, in musicians terms, I'm definitely like a heavy sampler for this film, not, not all films, but it's at least half uh, quotations, image quotations from other sources. And in these cases, these are images of crystals growing. Some of the images are um, <clears throat> sped up in time. Others are not. Others like literally grow that quickly. And because of um, J.H. Rosny's stories about the ferromagnetics and this new sort of mineral species, let's call it, um, and because of my own discovery on working on the film of mineral evolution and just thinking about the ways that different um, entities uh, grow, advance, spread, propagate. But I like the idea of thinking about, about being able to cast these crystalline forms as multiple things. So they're both, you know, the hippohoots or the ferromagnetics, the kind of villain of the fiction story, but they're also um, indexical scientific images of crystals growing and propagating. Um, so they, they function as more than one thing in the film. And I think this is really tied to the way the film swings back and forth between science fiction and more kind of epistemological um, sci-fi and sci-fact ways of knowing. I don't know if you know this man. Um, if you recognize him. I, I mean, I don't know. If I had to guess, I would say Faraday. Yes. <laughs> but I don't know. Yes, it's Faraday. Is it Faraday? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, sure. I know his um, his lectures to the public. They're amazing, beautiful. Yeah. I know that you you made a, a movie in 1994 five called on, <laughs> on the various nature of things uh yeah. that was inspired by michael faraday's conference and <laughs> um and the the, yeah. the his idea that people needed to be more aware of a uh, of a uh, of the everyday reality of physics and um and there is that quote i say apparently for you must not imagine that because you cannot perceive an action it doesn't exist. It's true that film, you know, even though it was, yeah, 90, almost, yeah, it was a long time ago, 1995 or so. This is, this new film is a closer cousin to that film than anything I've made in the years in between. So it is a, it's a funny, not funny, but um, an interesting, um, combination of a love of science and a love of metaphysics <laughs> um, and a love of um, the intimate and the haptic and sort of what we know through non-empirical means that even an image like this, it could it can be the villainous <laughs> uh, ferromagnetics just up to their own thing, spreading across the planet, or it can be this interscalar, you know, microscopic world, this whole universe that's happening right now that's very quotidian, but seems alien just because we aren't able to see at that scale. You know, the doors 
to our human house, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our touch, our hearing, our sensory doors are incapable of seeing at this scale or sensing at this scale, but that doesn't mean the things aren't happening. So I guess I, I take advantage of um, the limitations of our, <laughs> of the doors into our house to sort of suggest there's a lot of other things going on out there. <laughs> In a, in a very recent interview, you said that you weren't a narrative thinker and <laughs> that you <laughs> and that you you weren't uh, used to to um, to narrative filmmaking. What what difference do you make between uh, between telling and retelling and producing? Um, Uh, for example, producing a narrative film. Um, If you can make I guess one. I just, it's I just like, know. yeah, it's, I mean, traditional narrative, causal, um, linear stories, I think they're incredible and I love reading them, but I'm not a natural spinner of stories in that way. I do feel that I'm a teller, <laughs> But the way I tell is maybe more spatial or landscape driven or um, it's more like describing a field of events um, where everything's maybe happening all at once and how we navigate time is just, you know, which event we go to. It's a sort of, I don't know, that's not a very good way of describing it, but I just, I think my... Um, my natural tendencies towards telling are not particularly linear. And while I can read and appreciate seeing conventional narrative, it's not um, how my own brain works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my storytelling is a, is a less linear, more associative, more field of events, um, maybe more sculptural um, mode of telling. It's it's interesting because uh, the first the first image of uh, of your movie is this one, and I don't know um, hearing you. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's the Herschel drawing. Yeah, William Herschel's drawing of the Milky Way, but turned on its side, so it looks like a walking figure. Yes. Usually, it's the other way. Um, it's shown horizontally. Okay. Yeah, it's to me, it was like ah, it's perfect this way because it looks like my, it looks like the hippohoods, it looks like the star people. Mm. It's a, it's a figure. It's anthropomorphizing the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because it's a kind of constellation, and yeah, what you were saying is. about the the fact that your your telling is more uh, spatial, landscape based. Um, Do you see in the, the this image of the constellation a uh, potential um, image for your the, the way you that that could characterize the way you you tell a story? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I I think the film, not just this one, but some of my other films, it's it's just a a corral or a pin full of episodes. And they do occur in a certain order in the film, but I think retroactively when we remember them, we don't make meaning based specifically on the order they are in the film. I think we call on them based on our own affinity, you know, what we connect with and which episodes we retrospect, re retroactively kind of rub against one another to make meaning yeah i think i i think you're right i think i kind of work in a constellation field <laughs> <laughs> that seems accurate to my experience <laughs>